This is the Behringer Flow 8. And this is a jam donut. And in one way, they are exactly the same. Well, neither of them are a big part of my life, even though I like them a lot. Let me explain. The Flow 8 is fairly unique in that it is an eight channel digital mixer in a compact format. In Australia at the time of writing, the Flow 8 can be had from around 450 Australian dollars. But I purchased mine before all the prices of all the things of all the world went up. And it also had an open box discount applied. So it's worth considering that if I bought it at today's prices, I'd be harder on it than I'm going to be. Do with that as you will. It weighs 1.4 kilograms. And while I wouldn't call it at all flimsy, I would say that it doesn't quite have that built like a tank feel. Certainly, the labels are wearing off. And I've been quite gentle with it. You're just going to have to take my word on that. Around the back, there's a USB-B port for hooking up a computer and using the Flow 8 as an audio interface. A micro USB port provides power and you can't power the unit via USB-B alone. Oh, and the micro USB format was dated even when the Flow 8 was launched. So it would be better if it were the more modern USB-C format. Also, Facebook communities report that this micro USB power connection has been known to break and require repair. Mine has been fine to date. On the front, there are eight faders for channel levels. These LEDs at the top serve two purposes, to show clipping and to help align the fader levels on the physical unit with the fader levels in the app as the faders on the physical unit are not motorized. I'll show you how that works in a bit. The app LED indicates Bluetooth pairing and connection, and the audio LED indicates when Bluetooth pairing is active for audio streaming. They are two separate connections. There's a large knob for master volume and three smaller knobs for menu navigation, headphone level, and Bluetooth slash USB level. And I wanna come back to that last one because it's a bit more clever than that. Oh, and these two things look like knobs, but they're not. They're stops for holding a smart device. I seldom use them. You can see that my iPhone SE in its case kind of works, but my Pixel 7 in a case, not so much. Plugging in cables helps a bit. All stereo mono pairs are TS unbalanced only. Channels three and four are combo jacks, which I like, and can receive TS and TRS for balanced non-XLR signals, as well of XLR, of course. Channels one and two are XLR only, and are the only two mic channels that supply phantom power. Main outputs are XLR, and there are two monitor or auxiliary or OGS sends, and they are balanced TRS, though of course they'll work with TS as well. These are a big deal. More in a moment. There are also jacks for a headphone and for a foot switch, which you can use for, well, these functions. Then buttons. Tap can be used to tap tempo out for time related effects. The mute button has two functions. Press it short to mute the effects and press it long to mute all channels. The FX1 and FX2 buttons allows you to set what is being sent to your effects. Hitting either the monitor one or monitor two buttons allows you to set the monitor levels while selecting main allows you to set the levels for the main mix. Holding down the main button allows you to gain access to the gain on each of the channel's inputs. This is very handy. Holding down buttons for monitor one and monitor two simultaneously will provide access to the auto gain function, which will automatically set the gain for the inputs, but I never use it because I don't like the fact that it will turn on phantom power if it doesn't detect anything on channels one and two. So I have to be honest, I can't tell you if it's any good or not. If you'd like to see that in a separate video, let me know and I'll quickly put one together. The menu button provides access to settings for these things. But what we can see and physically access on the Flow 8 itself is only part of the equation because it was designed to be used in conjunction with a smart device. And there are some things that you just can't do on the Flow 8 without hooking up a smart device. Here's a list of them, as best I can ascertain. So perhaps we should take a look at the app. In this case, I'll show the app on my Pixel, but there is an iOS app if you're an Apple person. Oh, and it works well on iPad as well. Connecting to the app looks like this, though I've done a little bit of setup to get it to this stage. Let me know if you'd like a separate video on that. I'm just trying to avoid the boring stuff. 
What I can say is that I found it easier on an Apple device than I did on an Android device. What you see first is the mixer screen with access to FX, monitor and main mixers that we saw on the physical unit via the buttons. And you can see that as I move a physical slider on the unit itself, it will move the slider in the app. However, then the channel level is not really represented by the physical position of the fader on the physical unit, which is where those LEDs at the top of each channel comes in. They light up whenever a physical mixer position is not the same as the position of the fader in the app. And it goes out again when it is back in alignment. Hitting the setup cog, we can select from a range of presets for each channel. We can create a mixer snapshot. Uh, we can set some preferences and we can change the routing setup. That is where and how inputs come into the flow eight and where outputs go out. So that's the whistle stop tour. And there's a lot to like about the Flow 8. Let's run through them. The two auxiliary sends that the Flow 8 has is really rare in this space. I actually can't name another mixer in this space that has them, and they are fantastic. They can be run as separate mono or paired as stereo, and this is a big one. They can be set up as either pre or post fader. This hugely increases the number of use cases the Flow 8 will be appropriate in. It's huge. Behringer tends to offer flexible routing on their digital mixers, and the Flow 8 is no different. Here's an example. The USB audio that it will get from your computer will come with two stereo channels, and those two stereo channels can either be adjusted with the Bluetooth USB knob, which is the default, or there's a setting which would allow you to put one or both of those stereo channels onto this fader here, which is five and six, or this fader here, which is seven and eight. So you get a choice about whether you get more control over your computer's USB volume by assigning them to a fader, or whether you use those fader channels for audio only and leave the USB audio input coming from your computer on this Bluetooth knob right here. That was a really clever design decision. I wouldn't normally show you what's underneath, but have a look here. See these mount points? Well, they're designed for a, uh, a mounting system that is offered by Behringer for this unit so that you can mount it to microphones and the like. Uh, Yamaha does a similar thing with their smaller format mixers and I find them invaluable in various mounting situations. And I wish more manufacturers would do that. A surprising number of things can be done from the physical unit without requiring the app. Uh, the only one that I'm really missing is pan. Otherwise, all of the big things that I need to do in a live environment, I can do from the front of the unit. And importantly, I think it sounds okay. It's quiet enough and the sound quality seems just fine compared to other mixes that I own in its price range. Except when I turn it on. Take a listen to this. Now, to be completely clear, after about 45 seconds, it settles down and noise is not a problem for the remainder of the time that I have the unit on and until the next time that I turn it on again. But, okay, so while we're on the negatives, Bluetooth is wireless and wireless can be a little bit flaky. And I have had a gig in a live environment where everybody was having an issue with wireless. And so sure, the Flow 8 also had an issue with wireless. It's not a fault of the Flow 8, it's just the nature of wireless, but you need to be okay with that. You also have to be okay with the fact that you need to use a smart device. Some people don't want that to be part of their mixer and live mixer experience. If that's the case, this is not for you. Oh, and when I installed the Flow app on my Android device, a Pixel, I couldn't get it to work. Turns out, I had to turn on location awareness for the application. Why does a mixer app need to know your location in order to function? 
got me. For those on Apple devices, I had no such issue. Hey, there's no like off switch on this thing. Why do manufacturers do that? How much do you save by not having a switch, like a power switch on it? How much does that save? So to summarize, the Flow 8 is not perfect and compromises have had to be made to bring it down to a price point. But I think most of those compromises are understandable and have been implemented in a smart way, except for the lack of a power switch. And that the Flow 8 is the most powerful and flexible compact mixer in its price point and by some way. And actually, at the beginning of the video, I said that the Flow 8 wasn't much a part of my life, that I didn't use it as much as its features and value suggested that I should. But during the course of this video, I find myself asking, well, maybe I should give it another try. Maybe I'm missing the point. Which also means that I probably need to find some more room for donuts in my life.